it's good to have everybody this evening as we have uh, all come together to look into the word of god which is the word of life as peter told our lord jesus christ to whom shall we go to whom shall we go for you have the word of life let's bow our heads in prayer holy god we come before you are thrown this hour recognizing that you are the awesome god of the universe thank you for another day like this or rather another evening like this which you have given to us and thank you for those who have uh, logged in who are anxiously waiting to hear you, your word i pray that your holy spirit will uh, open our, our eyes to behold the wondrous truth from your book this is my prayer in christ's name amen we are continuing our study on the book of colossians Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Last week we saw the Apostle Paul reminding the Colossian church to be watchful, to be watchful of their spiritual life, to be on the alert. And we saw also that throughout uh, the Bible, this issue of watchfulness was on the forefront. Our Lord Jesus Christ told his audience to be watchful, to be on God. He told the disciples to be on God. He also told them to watch be careful we we say we say that all that glitters is not gold just because something looks like it's gold doesn't mean it is gold and so paul also told the philippians to be watchful of false teachers you see, wherever you have the kingdom or the temple of God, as our Lord Jesus Christ said in Revelation, you will always have the temple of Satan behind it. Everywhere you have God's temple, look not further, you will find the temple of Satan to attack God's temple. Satan is always busy attacking the plan of God. That's why we should be very watchful, very careful. And today, we begin with we are complete in Christ. That's the topic for today. We are complete in Christ. We are complete in Christ. Colossians 2 verses 10 through 15. Colossians chapter 2 verses 10 through 15. For in him and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made with that hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in your transgressions and circumcision of your flesh, he made you alive 
together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities. He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. We are complete in Christ. We are complete in Christ. And we see, we have seen along that uh, people uh, in the time of the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to this church, there were people, false teachers, telling them that something is missing, that they don't have superior knowledge, that they are not yet complete as they as they think they are, that they are more fulfilling than they are because they have superior knowledge. The same thing today, there are people who go around or some preachers who tell people who have personally trusted in Christ that they are lacking something. And some call it second blessing. There are some churches, they spend time in prayer so that they can have the so-called second blessing. They, to them, something is missing. They are not complete yet until they receive this second blessing. Paul comes along and cancels that notion. In verse 10, Paul says, you are totally and unequivocally complete in him. You have been made complete. Nothing is lacking. In the work that God himself did, nothing is lacking. There is nothing. To say that something is lacking is to say that Christ is not complete. Because Christ, remember, he is our wisdom. When, when the, the, the wisdom, the radiance of God who indwells us has everything, the treasure of God in him. And so when we are in him, we share his completeness. Christ is sufficient in everything. He is the top, bottom, and in between. And so it is clear as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, nothing is missing in you. Nothing is missing by way of salvation. Nothing is missing by way of experience. You're not looking for a new experience to come to make you complete. The moment you are entered into union with Christ, you are declared complete. You are full. You are made full in him. You are, accepted, you, are, you are accepted before God, not partially, but as one who is complete. That should give you comfort. You are not on a waiting list. You are not on probation to see if you will, make a, you will complete something and then you will be brought into the family of God. Now, the moment you trust in Christ, you are brought into union with him, and thereby you are in royal family of God. And that's what Paul wants the Colossians to know. In doing so, Paul, the Apostle Paul gives the Colossians five reasons why they are complete in Christ. Five reasons why they are complete in Christ. One, they have received spiritual circumcision. They have received spiritual circumcision, verse 11. And in him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision 
made it with Dr. Hands. That's for one reason of what authentication that the Colossians, as well as you, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, is complete. You are complete by way of that trademark of circumcision. In the Old Testament, circumcision was a trademark of covenant relationship between Israel and God. You cannot be a true Israel unless you are circumcised. In fact, it started with Abraham. That covenant relationship with Abraham was rectified by circumcision. So circumcision became the symbol that represents a covenant between God and the people of Israel. And that's why if you are a Gentile, if you want to crystallize, crystallize, if you want to become, uh, 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 join the Jewish religion, the first thing you must do is to be circumcised. That is a mark of belonging. And so Paul comes along here and tells them, listen, Colossians, to demonstrate that you have been made complete. The Bible makes it so clear that your completion is rectified by the circumcision done by the Holy Spirit. You see, we are on a superior level as to oppose to the Old Testament covenant. Our covenant is superior in the sense that it is the Holy Spirit who did the circumcision himself. It wasn't done with knife, not with human hand, not by cutting off the flesh, rather by the inward circumcision by the Holy Spirit. John 3, 5 tells us how the Holy Spirit plays a role in our regeneration. In, in our regeneration, John 3, 5, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I said to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God unless one is born of the Spirit. That's inward birth, inward regeneration, inward circumcision that is accomplished by the Holy Spirit is one aspect that makes the believer to know that he has been made complete. Titus, Titus 3 verse 5, Titus 3 5, Paul says the same thing about the work of the Holy Spirit. He saved us not on the basis of this which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, renewing by the Holy Spirit. The work, the inward work of the Holy Spirit is a reference to inward circumcision. The Holy Spirit is not right now making, it's not, it's not working on circumcision, it's not working on circumcising us. You have already been circumcised. And that's what makes you complete. The second thing Paul wants to hammer to, to bring to their forefront why they are complete. Two, they have been raised from the old life. They have been raised from the old life. Verse 12 having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So the second reason why they are complete is because they have been raised from the old life. So I just want to, we, we see the, 
we, we see baptism here. So often people see baptism, they go, they go ballistic. They go say, they get so excited. Well, what is the concept of baptism? Romans chapter six, verses one through three. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in saying that grace might increase? May it never be. How shall we who died in sin still live in sin? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? In fact, in verse 4, therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, so we to my walk in newness of life, in newness of life. This is the is a baptism. In reality, is just simply a teaching aid. It's a teaching aid. But Peter tells us baptism. What about baptism doesn't remove sin? A person is not saved because he's baptized. And a person doesn't lose his salvation because he's not baptized. Baptism has no connotation to salvation. But there are passages in scripture to demonstrate this. For example, the thief on the cross never saw any water, not in the name of baptism, as we know it in the Bible. And yet he walked from death into paradise. You say, well, that's a thief. Uh, he didn't have any chance. Well, God doesn't play any partiality. Uh, what, what goes for Tom goes for, for Dixon. But what's more, when you look at uh, Acts chapter 10, verses, we know that the mark of a believer is the indwelling Holy Spirit. The mark of a believer is the indwelling Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 8, Paul says, but from verse 9, Paul says, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't belong to God. If you don't have indwelling Holy Spirit, you don't belong to Christ. So the down payment of the Holy Spirit is a mark that we are God's children. But when you look at Acts chapter 10, and talk with me there to Acts chapter 10, I want to show you that baptism does not make a complete salvation. Holy Spirit is a guarantee that we are already saved. Verse 43, 10, 43. Now here was Peter preaching the gospel to the house of, uh, of Colonius. Of, of him, Christ, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. That is the key of salvation right here. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And so in verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. What do you think happened here? What do you think happened in this passage? It says, while Peter was still speaking, yet Peter hasn't finished his gospel message, but they already received the Holy Spirit. What, what happened? Well, in verse 42, they did not receive the Holy Spirit because Peter didn't tell them what, to believe in Christ. In verse 42, verse 41, verse 40, God raised him up in the third day. And those things are stories. Up until when Peter started the gospel, there was nothing about the Holy Spirit coming upon them until verse 43, when he gave them what to do to be saved. Of him, whoever believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. The moment they hear that, without a word, silently they put their trust in Christ. God saw the signal of their faith and unleashed the Holy Spirit upon them. 
they weren't baptized yet. It was after that Paul, Peter said in verse 47, surely no one can refuse the water for this to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit, just as we did. Can he? In other words, these people already say. And what, what then does that water baptism signify? It's a teaching aid to show us what happens. We are dead in our sins, trespasses. Envision yourself in the mud, in the mud of sin, dead, completely dead. And Christ comes into that mud, take upon that mud on himself, and crucify that mud with, with himself, and then died three days. He rose again with you because your sins have been paid for. And now he brought you to new life. That's a symbol of what happens when we go into water. When you go into water, what happens? You don't breathe in water. When you go into water, you, you, you hold your nose. In other words, you don't breathe. That moment of no breath, or no, that moment you have ceased breathing, of course, not, not for too long, the moment you ceased, for breathing, since you are breathing, you are signifying that that you, this is what happened to you. It, it, it's just a symbol. In the same way, when we eat the Holy Communion, it, it doesn't mean we are eating Christ's flesh or drinking his blood. But it, but it, 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 it has a connotation. The same way of baptism, baptism has a connotation of demonstration of what happened. It's not happening right there. The same time when you eat Holy Communion, Christ is not dying that day. But it's a reference of what already took place. So baptism is a reference of what already took place, a reference. You stop breathing, signifying that you died with Christ, buried with him as he took your sins away. On the third day, Christ rose again. When the when the when you when you are taken up from the water, the first thing you do when you your head takes lifts from the water, the first thing you do you breathe. That's showing new life. You bury the old life in water, in baptism, in the death with Christ where your sins were buried. Now you are lifted up to new life. Who did all this? God. God lifted you up. God took you and buried you with his son, Jesus Christ. All, your old life, you are seeing everything about your sinful behavior, your habits, all those things have been buried with Christ. When he died, you died because you were in, in him. When he rose again, you rose again with him in the new life, not in the old life again, but in a new life. And that's the significance of what Paul is telling them in verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So the third thing, the apostle gives, the third reason, the apostle gives to the Colossians why they are complete in Christ is that they have been given new life. They have been given new life. Verse 13. And when you were dead in your transgressions and your uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. That's good news. Having forgiven not just some transgressions, not a couple of transgressions, but having forgiven all transgressions. 
Christ took them all away. And God buried them in Christ. And then he forgave you. You are forgiven. I don't care how bad you are or how bad we are. I don't care what we have done. Every sin was wiped out. And God said he will remember them no more. It is because of this forgiveness that was that because of this forgiveness we are complete in Christ. There is no sin in us waiting to be forgiven in Christ. They have all been wiped out. The, 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 the salvation, the sin before the cross, which was a separation between us and God forever. What separates people is that the sin before the cross. That's where we are. And now we have died in that sins buried with Christ, now moved over on the other side of the cross. On this side of the cross, every sin we have ever committed that would have taken us to the lake of fire have been cleared, wiped clean, cleansed, never, never to have stain again. That, 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 that slate, if you will, has been wiped clean. It's no, it will no longer be the basis for our internal condemnation. And that's why Paul could say, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Condemnation is removed. You stand complete before Christ. Nothing can take you away from that position. Nothing can remove you from the love of God, which is rooted and fixed in Christ. So that's a, a comfort. That's a man, that's a peace that you and I should have, that we have been made alive together with Christ, together with Christ. In other words, right now, right where you are, you are not waiting one day, I'm going to be made alive with Christ. No, you are already made alive with Christ. That's what Paul is trying to get the Colossians to see. Look at chapter 3 when we get there. Verse 3. Colossians 3, 3. For you have died. Arrows tense in the Greek. At one point, you died. You can never die the same death again. At one point, you died. For you have died in Christ. And for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life or Christ who is our life is amazing. Christ is now your life. Do you know that? Or do you think that you are still your own man, your own woman? I have my I am I have control over my own life. No, Christ is your own life. Christ is your our life. So Paul says, when Christ who is our life is revealed then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Uh, so the, your life is already hidden in Christ, the treasure box of God. When he's revealed, we will be revealed with him. That's comfort. That's comfort. First John 5, 11 and 12. First John 5, 11 and 12. John says, and the witness is that, and the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Sometimes we read the Bible, we read it so fast that we don't really pay attention to what we just read. Let me read it slowly. And the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life. Do you have internal life? Do you have internal life? Yeah, I know, I know everybody saying, yeah, yeah, what do you think? Me too. Now, has given us internal life, and this life is in his son. Where is his son? Verse 12. He who has the son has the life. 
He who has the son has the life. As a believer, the son indwells us. And nobody will kick, nobody will kick Christ out of us. By the indwelling of Christ, that life, eternal life we're talking about indwells us. We already have it. It's in Christ who indwells us. And that's what Paul wants to clarify with this confused Colossians. The, the third area Paul uh, touches is they have been given new life. Again, we just completed. They have been given new life, verse 13, having been forgiven of their transgressions. They have been set free from three areas. The Colossians, including you and myself, we have been set free from three areas because we have been set, given new life. The new life we have has caused us to be set free from three areas. One, or A, we have been set free from the world. We have been set free from the world. See, there are three enemies we, that, fa that we face as Christians, as believers. Three enemies. They are locked, ready to knock you down or to knock me down. The moment you wake up, they are already awake. In fact, they don't sleep. The, the bad news is that they don't sleep. First John chapter 2. John talks about this enemy. Do not love, verse 15, John, 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world, nor the, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, if love of the Father is not in him. See, the, the first enemy we have is the world. The, the world is our first enemy. The world wants you badly. The world wants you badly. The world wants you to fit into their mold. It wants you to fit in their system. Yeah. There's a talk of war going on, if you don't know. Romans 12. Romans 12, verse 2. In Romans 12, verse 2, Paul tells the Romans, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect, and do not be conformed to this world. Let, let, let me put it this way. The greatest attack of the believer is the world. The world system is your greatest arsenal that bombards and wants to destroy you. J.B. Phillips' translation of this verse is very catchy. J.B. Phillips' Bible translates it this way. Don't let the world squeeze you into its own mold. But let God re remove your mind from within. Powerful translation. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. See, the world wants to squeeze you. It's a mold. Those of you who have seen, uh, I think I got a box here. Those of you who have seen uh, brick, brick, uh, brick makers, this is like a brick. This is like a, a mold. They get all their mold, all their mixture, or the gravel, whatever they mix, and they put it in here and they press it hard. They're making brick. When they they press it, when they press it hard and press it hard, then they gotta flip it over. And that uh, uh, mode or wh whatever they had put into this mode takes the shape of this mode. And so 
Philip is telling you, JP Philip is telling you, don't let the world squeeze you to conform to their mold. And that's what the world is doing. And if they, the world is succeeding in doing that. It's, it's succeeding in, in getting Christians to be conformed to this world, to, be, to fit into their mold, to dress like the world, to think like the world, to act like the world. And the world doesn't want you to be different. And that's the funny thing about it. Don't be different. Even in school, young, young, young stars or young children, when you are in school, you look different. The world doesn't want you to be different. Be like us. Everybody is doing it. Why be different? That is the that the that is the mod, We are. This is the model. You know what they, they hear. This this is model. That's old old system. Don't, don't live in the old system. We live in the model. That's the world speaking to you. If you don't understand, the world wants you to be like them. But the Bible said, don't be conformed to its demand. That's one attack. If you defeat the world, you will defeat every system that the devil throws at you. The, the world is number one. The world offers you materialistic, uh, uh, it's full of materialism. You want to be like everybody. If, uh, some, everybody is driving that car, I must drive that car. Everybody is, uh, have that kind of house, I must have that kind of house. Everybody is the world saying, don't be different, be like us. Come in, come in. Don't be, don't be left out. But Jesus has something different to say. We are not of this world. Even though we are in the world, we don't belong. As long as you are, as long as you are adjusting to this world, this world will continue to play numbers on you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You, they will, they will catch you. And when you begin to love the world, you cannot have two masters. When you love the world, what will happen is that you will hate God. You cannot love the world at the same time love God. One has to go. As a believer, which one? Which one do you want to go? That's a decision you have to make. There, there, there is nothing like middle ground. I'm gonna be neutral. Uh, not, I'm not really into the world as such. I'm not really into God that much. I'm just gonna be neutral. Not, no such thing. Hundred percent in the world, or hundred percent in on the God side. And so Paul tells them that they have been set free. New life means you have been set free from the love of the world. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. How can you do that? By the renewing of your mind. With what? With the word of God. As you look into the word of God, as you study the word of God, you are able to identify who you are in Christ. You are able to see beyond what is in this world. And you are able to see, you begin to look intently. You become heavenly minded, if you would. You become heavenly minded. You become, you start thinking about heaven than you think about this world. So the problem we have is that we think so much about this world. What is my retirement gonna be like? What am I gonna, if I retire 50 years from now, do I have enough money so that I can get some some time? Do go to to the beach? Then I have some dreams. We're just thinking about thinking about instead of. Think about heaven. Jesus said that himself in Matthew chapter 6. So whatever your mind is, that's where your thoughts are. Where are your thoughts? Are your thoughts in what you get in this world? Or are your thoughts upward, vertical, or downward, horizontal? You have to make up your mind. And Paul, when we get to chapter 3, I can't wait. Paul says in chapter 3, verse 1, if then, in fact, that if is if, if of reality, since then, that's the better translation, since then you have been raised up with Christ. 
Keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. In other words, fix your mind, fix your thought, fix your whole being on the things that is in heaven, on the things that are in heaven, not things that are on earth. Why? Why not things on earth? Peter, Peter has that question answered for us. Peter, first Peter, I'm, I'm sorry, second Peter chapter 3. That's why you shouldn't be so concerned about the things that are on this planet. Peter tells you why you shouldn't. In second Peter chapter 3, beginning from verse 10, he says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? On account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will be will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And then in verse 14 it says, Therefore, therefore, it means take a deep breath. For there is something important to be said. Breathe in and then listen to, be sure that you don't miss what comes next. That's the word of, that's the meaning of therefore, if you would. Therefore, beloved. He didn't just say therefore, he, he caught their attention with that word of belonging, beloved. Since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, spotless and blameless. Don't let the word take you out of your command post and then you'll be a loser entering into heaven. As many believers have entered into heaven empty handed. But for us, we still have opportunity to remedy, remedy our spiritual failures. We all have failed. But the good news is that we are still playing. The buzzer, the buzzer hasn't gone off yet. We haven't heard bye. You see, it, once you say bye, you throw your last ball, it doesn't count. But, but the clock is ticking. Some has five seconds, some has, still has 10 years playing. Some of us, maybe only one hour. I don't know. I'm not the person who, ma who makes that call. It's God himself. So the second thing, the second enemy is the flesh. The second enemy we have is the flesh. And Paul tells us in Romans 8, verse 8, Romans 8, 8, that our flesh is, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. See, well, this flesh wants a lot of faith. The, the, the flesh wants something good. See, the, the, the world wants you to be, the, the world attracts you, the attraction of the world to your eyes wants you to conform to the system, and the flesh wants everything that is good. The flesh wants whatever opposes God. That's what the flesh wants. The flesh wants you to go where Christ doesn't want you to go, to do that which Christ doesn't want you to do, but it makes because it makes you feel good. The feel good syndrome. Remember what, I, what we started last uh, couple of weeks about uh, the secularism we find ourselves now, the humanistic viewpoint thinking, the humanistic view, whatever makes you feel good, treat yourself, you deserve to be, you, you deserve something good, kind of. Treat your flesh. That's the flesh, if the flesh doesn't get you in trouble with God, nothing can. And so Paul 
tells us that we have been delivered and given new life. And that new life means we have been set free. The word, the second one, the flesh, Romans 8, 8. And the third thing, see the devil. The devil, 1 John 5, 19. The devil is the one who walks around intending to destroy us. The devil, he sets the trap for you. Everywhere you make, every step you take, the devil locks, waiting to bring you down. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, be under God, be on, be under God, be under alert. The devil roars, means he's crawling like a lion, seeking whom to devour. The devil is the one who tempts us constantly through the same nature that indwells us. He uses the same nature to make us go against the plan of God and his aim. You know his, what his aim is? He knows, Satan knows that you have your internal life secured. He knows that. But his aim is to make sure you enter into heaven empty-handed. I don't know what entering to heaven empty-handed will look like, but I want to tell you one thing. I don't want to get there and find out. If you want to get there to find out, when I see you there, I say, I told you so. I told you so, but you didn't listen. Now you find out, what, what, are, what are you going to do? The answer, obviously, is nothing. You're going to remain in that state for all eternity, billions and billions of years. You are still in that state. Whereas you, you, as a believer, you have the opportunity of making an impact and living legacy in the sense of time, in the sense of spiritual time. You have the privilege. You have the opportunity. You and I have the same privilege and opportunity to live a legacy that we carry into eternity. We are blessings abound. We are blessings abound. Number four, Paul wants the, Philipp the Col Colossians to know that they are complete in Christ by the virtue of the fourth reason, the cause, the cause, the cause placed on the Colossians, on the believers, has been removed. The cause placed on the believer has been removed. It's removed. Colossians, if, uh, Galatians 3 verse 13, Christ, by be, being on the cross for us, he became the cause. How did he remove this cause that God placed? It's a cause. Breaking, not fulfilling the law completely is a cause. God has given mankind a law to fulfill. And by the way, there are 613 laws in the Bible. Failure to not fulfill this 613 law constantly places man under a curse. For if you go by this law, you must fulfill it to the, to the last letter. And by breaking it all the time, you are constantly under a curse. Every day, you're under a curse, as far as God is concerned, because you're not perfect. You're not perfectly keeping the law. And so Christ comes along, took upon him the cause, and what did he do with this cause? He gathered all these 613 laws and the demands of this law. He nailed it to the cross. One, he canceled the, the certificate of death. All those things are certificates. See, certificate, God has that certificate. All contained, those certificates contain all these laws all the ramifications of these laws, all our failures, trials and errors, they are all in the certificate. Christ took the certificate straight to the cross and nailed it. God nailed it to his son, Jesus Christ, and then takes his place, his red pen, and cancels it. It's no good anymore. He didn't just cancel it. 
he took it out of the way. It's no longer the barrier. It's no longer a problem. It's no longer something that we should be concerned about. We, we, we are no longer concerned. Are we keeping this law? Are we being perfect in this one? Are we? No, those things have been taken out of the way. That's good news. That's a gracious work of a gracious father. And that's what he tells them in verse 14. In verse 14. Yeah. Let's, let's go back again to uh, verse 14. Look at verse 13. He made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Mind you, he has forgiven you your transgressions. You are now a new, you have new life. How does that new life function? Turn with, turn to just flip back, uh, flip in front, rather, Colossians 3 from verse 12, 12 to 14. And so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy, holy means sanctified, set apart, and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. These are the mark of new life that you have. Do you find yourself living a life of compassion? That's what we're asked to do. It's, in, in fact, it's a, it's, it's a command. It's a command. Put on a heart of compassion. Do you have compassion, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience? Let me let me remind you: gentleness, patience, kindness, those are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. What does that tell us? It tells us that we must maintain the feeling of the Holy Spirit constantly if we are to demonstrate compassion, kindness, gentleness, and patience. Again, number four, you have been the cost has been placed that the cost placed on man has been removed. They are no longer a barrier. The barrier of the cost has been removed once and for, forever by the virtue of Christ being nailed to the cross. He took it out of the way. Verse 14, having cancelled out the certificate of death consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us this certificate was hostile as far as god is concerned but jesus came along nailed it to the cross cancelled it which means it's no good anymore it's, he has rendered it useless having nailed it to the cross so number five the Apostle Paul gives the Colossians five reasons why they are complete in Christ. The fifth one, Satan and his demons have been defeated. Satan's, no, sorry, Satan and his demons have been defeated. They are no longer a threat to the believer. You can, you can shout for joy for that. Satan is no longer a threat to you. You know that? Do you know that Satan is no longer a threat to you? It's, it's not a threat. It's not a threat. If you it, Satan wants you to think that he's still a threat, and so that when you hear him bark, bark or bark like a dog, when Satan bark like a dog, you think, oh, this person has come and you, you, you shrink back. No, Satan is no longer a threat because verse fifteen tells us. In, in, uh, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, his rulers, all demonic rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. It's, it's finished. When he said it's finished, it was a public display that Satan, all the fighting that Satan fought from the Garden of Eden. Until the cross. Remember Jesus Christ when he gave the first gospel in Genesis 3:15. He said that he, he, Satan, 
we bruise him on the heel. But he, Christ, we bruise him on the head. Life is on the head, not on the heel. When, when Christ hung on the cross, Satan's head was cut off. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Let me be so graphic. His head was chopped off. It, it's funny uh, it, that, that the symbol the Bible uses to de de depict Satan is snake. Have you ever seen snake? Have you ever killed snake? I have. Many times back in back home in Nigeria, I kill many snakes. You get a knife, you see the snake moving forward, you just go straight and you chop the head off. You chop the head off, watch watch the whole the whole body of the snake start moving around, moving, going fire up, start it, it can even start to go in as, as if still alive. It's finished, it's done with. All he has is a moment of time. The, the reflex that is still holding it, once it's over, it's a dead thing. The head is off. Where the poison is lodged in the head, not in that body. And so since the poison is, has been removed by cutting off the head, Satan is finished. And it, it reminds me of my, my, my younger growing up. It's funny looking at all these things. Uh, back home, before you eat a chicken, your parents will ask you to go catch one. They'll show you one chicken and then you run around. You run and run and run, sometimes for hours. Because once the chicken notices that he, she has been marked for death, no, he's going to call, that chicken is going to call for heaven to rescue. So you're going to run from one place to another, and you run this way, the chicken run that way, you will be running until you are sweating, until you finally catch the chicken. And when, it's, when you run the chicken to death, like it's tired, exhausted, then you cut the chicken. You get the chicken, you cut the chicken's head off, and then you have to take the feeders off. How do you do that? I, I, can't, I still remember vividly one day, when we cut one chicken, killed it, cut the head off, it bled, and then we put it in the in the bowl. And then at that time, you have to, the easy way to remove the feeders is to use boiling water, hot water. And then we already had water boiled. And the moment we put that chicken, we took that hot water and poured it in the basin. The, 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 immediately, that chicken jumped off the basin and started running. We, we, it was funny looking at the chicken without head. He, people tell you you run like a chicken without head. It's actually true. It, we ran, it ran for a little while, but not too far. And it fell down. The reflex was gone. So is the devil. Jesus has handed him his defeat on the cross. Don't let him scare you. He's dead. He's finished. It's over. Complete, for you are complete in Christ. And so you should walk in your custom-made cabin, as you were, that God has set for you, and not be afraid of what tomorrow will bring. So long as you are mindful of these three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil still wants you to think that he still has role to play over you. No. Let, let me give you the secret. Satan cannot defeat you. You can only defeat yourself. Christian defeat is always self-defeat. It's always self-defeat. You made it to yourself. You are what you are because of the decision you choose to make. If you choose to walk in the light, the light will shine in you and you will have profound life. You will have amazing life. You will have attractive life. You will have a life that will be recorded. A life charming for, to the angels. You will have a life that when God sees, he will say, this is my child. He truly represented me in the devil's world. Don't 
let the world squeeze you into its mold. Father God, thank you so much for this moment. Thank you for this opportunity you have given us to look into your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit will bring this truth to us. Open our eyes and cause us to realize the reason for our being here on the, on the planet Earth. And Father, thank you that you have kept our people safe. I pray that you continue to do so from this deadly virus that you have unleashed upon the world. And keep our eyes on you. Keep our hearts burning for your kingdom. Father, keep us from being sucked in into the system of this world. And keep us from being uh, consumed by the loss of this flesh. And keep us from the evil one. Thank you, Father. It is my prayer that you keep our hearts in your word. Keep us, make us pray in sense. And keep our hope, our hope in the returning Christ until we meet again. This is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.